I posted on Instagram yesterday um, that it was my birthday and I said I wasn't going to do a 22 things I learned in 22 years because it's kind of annoying and I said that as well because I'm learning to speak less and listen a lot more and get a lot more humble this year and only speak when I think it contributes and when I think it's a value but I think that in seeing that I do have a growing platform and I have an ability to capitalize on something important in my life, you know, my 22nd birthday, um, I figure that I would do a 22 things I learned in 22 years um, of things I find actually valuable, not just me on my soapbox. So these are going to span from the beginning of more mundane, day-to-day -day informative things that I think you should know to, at the end, the more widespread esoteric philosophical things that I'd like to share for you that I've learned in my 22 years. So um, it's going to get more deep and profound, juicier as we go, so stay till the end and let's run through these these 22 things. Let's not waste any time. Um, I'm just going to run through this. I made a quick list, channel of consciousness, you know, what do I actually think, and then sorted them out through most, um, I guess, least provocative, most day-to-day -day useful to, you know, deep and juicy. So first thing that I think I've learned, that I know I've learned, is that cold brew is not just acceptable less, cold brew is not just acceptable all year round, but preferable all year round. And what I mean by that is that the caffeine amount is higher, which doesn't mean that we should be overdosing on caffeine, but does mean that you get more bang for your buck. Personally, um, I have been known to order a cup of coffee and have like the first millimeter because I take really tiny sips, and so when that is more concentrated, I don't need to get the full cup. I can do, you know, like just a small, a small amount of cold brew. I, do, I, I get a small auto ship um, amount from La Cologne, which has like smaller bottles because it's more expensive too. But um, with that, it's also less acidic, but more caffeinated, more bang for your buck. I think cold brew tastes miles better than normal coffee. That's just me. Anyway, secondly, cashews, pumpkin, and yellow curry are the perfect pasta sauce combination. It might sound weird, cashews, soaked cashews are like the basis for every creamy vegan pasta sauce basically because nothing compares to just the creaminess of cashews. Um, with pumpkin and yellow curry, I'm obsessed with this and the flavors are insane. I have not seen anyone else make this combination. I don't know how I came up with it, but it's like my most made recipe on my blog after my pad thai is my pumpkin yellow curry cashew pasta sauce. I will link that below. You should make it. That's one of the things I've learned in 22 years that stood out to me. Uh, third, you should be cooking all of your beans and grains with kombu seaweed. It's this seaweed that's really hard and then when you cook it in water with your grains it softens up and it gives a really nice umami flavor to whatever bean or grain you're cooking. It also makes it more digestible because it breaks down some of the like lectins and some of the things that can be more difficult to digest in beans and grains. But it's also an incredible source of iodine. Like if you cook a cup of dried beans with a sliver of kombu you get over like a thousand percent of your daily iodine in single servings from that. Um, I learned that when um, I went and saw a doctor a few, few months ago and my iodine was like slightly low and I was eating seaweed but not at, like putting it in things and now it's like skyrocketed and I don't have to worry about putting it in that many things because it's so powerful. So cook your beans, cook your, your grains with some kombu seaweed. I think it tastes great too and it's kind of fun to put it. Fourth, why the fuck are people still listening to verbal music when trying to write? That is an actual thing that has changed my life is I used to for years listen to, you know, rap and rock and like pop as I tried to do homework and coursework and write papers because I wanted to be entertained. But I realize now that like you can have background music while you work, but you want it to be non-verbal and instrumental or electronic. Like, I used to think that I am like the master intellectual doer that I can, it doesn't matter if people actually say that it's better to listen to classical music, which I don't always listen to classical. Often it's solfeggio tunes, it's solfeggio tones, or it's um, like electronic beepy music as I call it. I have a full productivity playlist uh, on Spotify that I will link down below of electronic good background music for while you work because when your brain is not focusing on the lyrics or the verbal output of like in music, it can actually have more energy to write. And that's not to say that sometimes I don't really want to listen to music, so I'll do it. But if I'm knocking out a paper or like a dissertation, bitch, I will, I will have my productivity things on. Or if I'm scripting, scripting videos, I will have my productivity tunes on. So playlist is down below. Um, fifth, 
Candles make a difference. Candles make a difference. Your environment, especially that we're now basically all working from home unless you're an essential worker, which if you are, I thank you. Um, now our environments need to be spot on and I love candles. There is a candle company on Etsy that I love that I just am obsessed with their scents. It's just an incredible company. I forget the name. So I will link the Etsy candle company that I love down below because I buy so many candles from them. They're amazing and I just really love scents. Other people like things like, I don't know, crystals or plants or whatever, or essential oils, which I used to be more into, but now I'm really into candles, and that has been my thing. Fire magic is my my, my, my favorite. Uh, not that I do that. I don't do rituals, as you guys know, because I'm lazy, and I just like to work with my mind. But I like lighting candles. Um, sixth, making my own bullet journal every week that really connects me to a schedule and like a matrix that I create really works well for me to align myself with a schedule that doesn't feel tedious but that I created in the sense that I've had journals and planners for years um, but within the past year I've really started to use a bullet journal layout that works for me and it's 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 like the highlight of my week is actually using like a straight edge to format the calendar and the day-to-day -day sections of my bullet journal, which I do like tasks and then appreciation and my goals and my intention and my affirmation and my end of the day reflection. So if you want to like a full video on my productivity skills that are practical and not just like I'm a boss ass bitch that's always been productive because in a sense that is true but in a sense there's also things that I probably do that other people don't know to do and I don't know other people aren't doing so I mean let me know down below if you want like a, a day in the life of a highly productive person video I'd be really really down to make that I take a break from my astrology to do that um seventh I prefer podcasts to tv shows or films and maybe that's the sensory deprivation where you can focus on one thing and really get the most out of the content because it's just the podcast. But I look forward to my morning podcasts of NPR, the New York Times, and like any crooked media political podcast that's out for that day more than I do my one hour of allotted documentary or learning video time in the evening because that's what I have going on. I worth, listen to podcasts while I work out often. Um, I do my soul cycle with the soul cycle music, but if I'm doing body weight exercises, I listen to that. And then while I get ready, I listen to podcasts. And I prefer that to my one hour of documentary footage at night. Uh, eighth, in astrology, I think that it dilutes the field if we let everything slide and say that, you know, all paths lead to the truth. Because, yeah, sure, technically all paths do lead to the truth. And in the 3D world we live in, there are some paths that make a hell of a lot more sense than others. And I more so found this as I began teaching, especially because um, obviously there are multiple different schools and techniques, but I think we have to be really careful where we're trying to people please and where we literally know that there's multiple approaches because it's different when the approach is like, I'm looking at this chart from a medical perspective versus a financial perspective versus like this literally means this and then this can mean the opposite thing. Like, no, that kind of comparison where it's kind of more... I think now I'm not going to speak on things that I don't know about, but if I do have a confident rationale behind what I'm saying, I'm not going to let anything slide because I don't want to dilute the field because there's more than enough misinformation out there. And I don't, obviously I'm not arguing with people. Like I don't go out of my way to interact with others online in the first place. But for example, if someone comments on my post and they're like equating the eighth house to sex, then I'm going to pull out the whole planetary joys. Um, assignment of the houses and things like that, like the astronomy that doesn't really validate that as much. Uh, so it, I, I'm just saying that I choose the most parsimonious path and that if something seems blatantly illogical that I'm not going to let it just kind of linger and be like, there's multiple paths to the truth. Like, fuck yeah, there are. And that's going to be a roundabout one, especially in astrology. We have to be careful about what we let slide because it's easy to form patterns when there actually are none. Um, ninth. Using an astrological election with the rising sign as my natal 6th or 12th house is pointless. And what I mean by this, uh, some of you might not understand if you're newer to astrology, but there's something called electional astrology, where we choose the astrology chart of a specific moment in order to begin something. It's an inceptional chart. It is the chart of the moment. Like, for a human life, the chart of our first breath is the promise for that human life. So if we're wanting to start a business or elect 
a time to send an email, we elect a chart that we want to have represent the promise of that thing coming into fruition. And the 6th and 12th houses are the most challenging houses, especially the 12th house. So if I ever choose a chart with my natal 6th or 12th house signs, which are Gemini and Sagittarius, it literally never works out well. Um, in 2019, when we had Jupiter and Sagittarius, I experimented a lot with Sagittarius rising so that I'd be able to have that Jupiter dignified in the first house. It literally never panned out. Like, literally any time I do something with Gemini or Sag rising, it goes to shit and it's not seen. Like, it's just, like, not seen because 6th and 12th houses are in aversion to the Ascendant. They are just unseen. And so if you're having trouble with anything in life um, and you are interested in electional astrology, I would stay away or try to, unless you have a really well-placed 6th or 12th house like stellium that you're trying to emphasize that's dignified by sign or bonafide, um, stay away from those. My 6th and 12th houses are like empty and so yeah, not my thing. Um, number 10, almost halfway there guys. Financially, this is a generalization, but financially investing is generally smarter than saving and I'm not uh, an investment master, I'm not a financial advisor, but if you've been following me, you guys know that honestly most of the content that I consume and like my For You page on TikTok is all stock talk and I just really, really, I've always known that I thought the stock market was so cool because it's, it's made up but it's made real and I guess everything in reality is like that, but I say this too, that the stock market is divination it's the stock market is a form of divination that's socially accepted it is like astrology for old white men where it's like multiple people setting intentions and watching that grow and then responding to it and um i realized that i mean actually i think this is pretty clear to people who are actually in the stock market that you can make more profit by investing than you can saving a lot especially with interest and i've seen this for myself just with investing in tesla and having that i happen to not just get lucky because honestly it's smart to invest in Tesla right now, but I got lucky and it's not like I invested a lot of my income or anything, but it's it's very, very it's grown a ton. And so it's grown more than just my monthly like savings that I put aside because I am like finesse finessing that. And that's why I still have a smaller savings account, but I plan more on investments and diversifying and getting into, you know, I don't know, just, just, just many different things. Um, Number 11 is a realization just for me. Um, I realized that I really love foreign policy and I didn't have that word to speak on that until about this year when I realized that I've always been so interested in government structure and how that compares across cultures and things having to do with the institutions of countries, not like I don't really care about the art and the food of other countries. Like, I want to know about the political regime. I've always been into that. Like, I've been a history person my whole life, and if you happen to have been a history teacher of mine, you know that I was, like, the weird kid who wanted you to lecture and, like, not ever stop. Like, I was really into it. But um, I realized within the past year that I would love to go into foreign affairs to an extent. Not even to an extent. Like, I would be down to do that, and that doesn't mean I'm okay with doing grunt work for 10 years in like an office and hoping to get a mid-level like CIA like abused work job kind of thing where I, would, I wouldn't put up with the 9 to 5 grind but I would love to bring back being a political astrologer for like a high level government um I could see this happening I don't know I have a, a, a high percentage of clients I'd say 60% of my clients are international, um, most of my clients are international, and a lot of them are actually from the Middle East, I would say about half, of, so probably 30% of my clients are from the Middle East, which is like a ridiculous percentage when you just think about me living here in New York with having no ties to the Middle East, but I've like read for, I, I can't say who they are, but like high profile, like family is there and so part of me is like I can reach out and be like you do, does your does your government want a professional astrologer because I'd move there because these countries aren't um necessarily ones that are like really um going through it right now but yeah I I've always seen myself going into politics I have no doubt that maybe I'll be the first astrologer to not just be like a consultant but actually be doing things so yeah we'll see um 12 now that I'm 21 I've realized that birthdays feel old um, I'm not gonna over-dramatize this and be like, I'm so old now, like, guys, I'm a grandma, which in a sense, kind of like, if you're on TikTok, like, I am kind of old, because it's ridiculous, and now 
like 15 year olds or the ones making the political activism and saying more intelligent things than I am. Like I follow Claudia Conway, who I think is, her mom's Kellyanne Conway, she's amazing, she's a boss ass liberal bitch, um, Claudia is, but she's like 15 and I didn't know that, I thought she was around my age because she's just so beautiful and outspoken and intelligent and like just so herself and um, just realizing that these kids are making such a difference and putting themselves out there in such dramatic ways and that um, now I, I, I just feel like after 21, birthdays feel redundant or passe and the year doesn't have as much oomph unless you're like 99 and so maybe 30 is a big deal but that's a kind of a I, I definitely have some internalized ageism and I'm actually like age, aging is something that honestly at this point really really does scare me um so we'll see but number 13 smarter spending sometimes means paying more and I mean this because I will pay more for conveniences to get done that allow me to focus on the more prominent things that I have a zone of genius in. So things that are not my zone of genius include right now for my business, like I have recently in the past few months gotten a video editor, uh, which I will not be editing this video so I don't need her on this, I'm just going to upload this, but like Jackie, one of my great great friends, we met in yoga teacher training. like bless, bless, we met during that years ago, uh, but I needed to outsource to a zone of, someone whose zone of genius was video editing, because I was spending, um, probably upwards of 20 to 30, eas easily 20, 30, 40 hours a month on video editing with the amount of things that I do, and that is not something, not only that I'm not proficient in, but it's something that I could tell I was doing incredibly, uh, inefficiently, and that was just, like my mental health was not doing well when I had to video edit and so I outsourced that and I also outsourced cleaning my apartment because if I am focusing on things that are like my, my output I would rather get that done and on, honestly it's weird because in New York I feel like there's so much of a focusing on your thing that even people that I know that um, have less disposable income than I do they still get maid service because it's kind of like having a housekeeper allows you to focus on your zone of genius. I think that's just, in New York there's a lot more energetic exchange of finances because I will pay for things out of pocket that I know might be ridiculous to some people, but my rationale is not, I want to save as much money as possible, it's how can I be efficient with my overall energy, which includes financial. Um, 14. You literally cannot know if someone is actually bypassing their problems. Um, if they aren't talking about their problems, you don't know if they're bypassing it. If they're speaking love and light, like you cannot tell if someone is bypassing their problems. And you also can't know if someone is being dramatic over the top and trying to perform sadness. Or you can't know if someone is actually releasing that and it's really healing for them to be dramatic. And like someone expressing their pain on a really dramatic level could be trauma drama and it could also be healing and someone also who is not speaking about their pain or who um, is being more love and light even as they're going through something could be bypassing or they could literally just have moved past that at this point and um, this isn't something I've struggled with but it's something that I feel the need to speak about a lot I have this year because I've just seen a lot of accusational things like this in various different tones that you literally cannot know whether someone is bypassing. Like you, I mean, you can you can presume, but you don't have to. Um, it, it might not be intelligent to overly state that when you can't get inside their mind. And um, I just say this because there's no. I don't find it energetically useful to nitpick someone to see if what they're doing is justified or the way that they're expressing themselves is in that way. That there are times when I really am over something and people are shocked and they think I'm bypassing, and there are times where I'm not over something and it seems petty, but like I'm not over it. So. Yeah, my two cents. Um, Fifteen. It is never them, it is always me. And this is something I've known for a long time that I may not have vocalized, that it's why I rephrase all judgments and all issues I have with other people into observations about myself. That you may have noticed that um, it, it's rare that I, even in very, very obvious problematic people, I really don't put the focus on them or speak about them at all, but rather I'll make a statement about myself and how I feel um, in relation to what I'm seeing. And instead of like right now being like, why is TikTok doing this to me and suppressing my content when um, cause I'm, I'm like working alongside some people who are into SEO and like I have a, cons I have some consulting people that I, I, um, do get input with, with just online strategy and 
some of them are literally saying you are not shadow banned like I can look at like you're getting so many views still like whatever but I can see that the percentage of those comes from no one but my own followers and so that like literally is like shadow banned and things like when I tweet at TikTok my tweets are automatically deleted and so it's so weird it's so weird um but my point of view is not why are they doing this to me but instead why do I place so much value on how many I see my work instead of building value with the A Thousand True Fans in that way? If you haven't read the A Thousand True Fans poem, I recommend you do. But um, that's one shift where even though I do, I, that's one of the things that like Petty and I haven't bypassed yet is like why was suddenly my platform just ripped kind of away from being able to reach how because I was growing to like 5,000 followers a day and now I'm losing. Like it's just, uh, it's a dopamine shock basically. Um, so drawing that back into myself. 16, and this might, I guess, trigger some people who are still in victim mindset, but being sad is always a choice. That's something that I really, really have learned over my life, but this year I've been really vocal about actually, is that more often than not, when I am in a bad mood or being sad, I am consciously choosing to stay in that vibration because I think that suffering enough will get me a reward in the end for being the saddest. It's my ego loves to be inflated by being the most of something and um, I'm stubborn and so sometimes I often I will choose to remain in victim mindset or being sad because I think that there will be a reward at the end for me and like yeah you did it you felt badly enough uh, when um, that's obviously just completely illogical and that goes back to being ruled by the ego instead of using the ego and so that's just another thing that um, I openly admit that, at least for me, being sad is a choice. Um, even with my deepest, deepest traumas or whatever the fuck you want to call shit that we lean on to justify um, remaining in that. But it's there's a difference between the immediate shock of a pain but remaining to be sad I think is decision based. 17. Sometimes the fight is not worth it. That even when someone else is in the wrong objectively and when you have something to get across, um, sometimes the fight is just not worth it. And everything to me is an equation of utility. If you're not familiar with utilitarianism, it's when you live your life based on minimizing pain and maximizing pleasure and your actions always add up to the ends. That momentary pain or momentary suffering is always justified if it brings about more pleasure for everyone in the end rather than you avoiding that right then. Um, it's kind of always looking to equate choices, which I think, I, I don't even literally, like, I'm that kid in philosophy that is like, literally I do not understand why you would not be a utilitarian, because it's like, there's no way around wanting to minimize harm, but with that, sometimes even if someone is really, really ignorant, and I think I could get a really good teaching point out of arguing with them, if it will take away more from my energy in the long term, sometimes I just block and delete. Um, you might have noticed that I don't, well, one, it's because I'm shadow banned, so I'm not getting haters as much as I did. I do get some still on like YouTube and Instagram, but um, now I actively decide, is this fight worth it? And sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's not me resigning, it's prioritizing my energy. Um, 18. This is recent, but I'm considering no longer labeling myself as much as a witch, as much as an astrological magician, and I guess I could call myself like an astrological magician subset of witch, but I don't even think of myself as like a cosmic witch just because the more and more that I see others' practices, mostly online, so it could be just, you know, those who are big online, but I don't do any of the stereotypical witchy holidays or rituals or I don't have the interest in the same things as a lot of other witches do and I, I know I can be totally different and an outlier and that everyone's practice is their own and I can call myself a witch um, if I want to but I, being someone who just sticks to the astrology side and doesn't think of it as much as innate ritual magic or chaos magic even as much as like deliberately timed intention setting around rea reality's principles um, and someone who I don't care about labels but I like to use labels to um, better understand where I am and where I can move forward I think they're helpful I don't attach to them overly um, like I get that no one is a set category in that word but we, we, we bleed into more categories and um, I'm wondering if I should be careful about calling myself a witch because I don't want to give off the impression that I am subscribing to practices that I don't because I've actually gotten some hate of people being like, stop calling yourself a witch if you don't practice magic uh, in the same way that we do. Um, and I know that they don't mean harm by it and they think that I'm appropriating that practice in some way, but it does get me thinking that, you know, maybe I do need to be more careful um, and that I am more of an astrological magician and that um, the traditional thought of a witch working with herbs and plants and things like that, just is not mean, you know, not even like a kitchen witch or anything. Um, 
19. I'd say that I have learned a new level of appreciation and gratitude within the past six months, largely due to uh, the pandemic, because my prime example of this is how the last week in February for me was unknowingly my last week at NYU because I took a trip to Sedona the week before spring break. So I was missing the week before we were missing school for spring break. I had a longer spring break. I knew for months that I would be out of school a week early for spring break. So while everyone else was in school the week before spring break, I was already on my trip because that's the way that this retreat that I went on um, was structured. And the first week of March was the week that everything went down, and so my last week of school was in February, and I unknowingly left for that week thinking I'm going to get back and take my finals, and NYU was pretty early to shut down and take everything online. Like, the second we had someone in Westchester with a case, NYU was like, while I was in Sedona, they were like, you know, we're shutting down, uh, going online. And so unknowingly, my last time ever being in a classroom, probably for the rest of my life, because I see myself being my graduate school being online for the next few years, um, that that was unknowingly the last time I'd ever be in probably one of my favorite environments that I thrive in, which is a classroom setting, and I miss that. And that just being ripped out was kind of a wake-up call for me to enjoy the little things, and now it's things like soul cycle classes that I don't know ever again if they'll be the same, not that I'm sure they'll reopen, but that the spacing and maybe not the same things like, you know, giving you things on your birthday and running around and high-fiving people that those things may never return, at least in my lifetime as a young adult. Um, and so that's been a wake-up call. 20. I've realized that growing an audience online is energetically traumatizing. The, full stop. Um, and that might sound weird because I think that there's a lot of dismissal of influencer culture as petty instead of seeing it just as the way that we are evolving in terms of um, occupation and humanity that now things are getting more ethereal and instead of working a nine to five maybe you're literally working on like your influence and that that can range from petty to really deep and obviously I am still minute in the grand scheme of things compared to other creators but being on TikTok you're shown to so many people that would not have algorithmically found you in their filter bubble that um, that exacerbated the energetic shock that I may not have had um, if I had not grown on that platform. That even though my growth, especially on Instagram and YouTube, is min minuscule, minuscule, I mean 12k is not um, not anything to be um, like over dramatizing, but I can say that the act of having so much energy thrown at you so many times a day, especially in DMs and comments, especially when it's like, a lot of it is flailing energy. What I mean by that is that they're, they'll ask a question, they'll be like, please, please, please reply, and that's like, no, 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 oh my god, I can't, I can't, I can't. Or they're um, just things where you can feel the desperation and a lot of grabbing you at your ankles and I think of the scene in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows where Dumbledore and Harry are on that island and all the horcrux dead people are trying to grab at their ankles that that's kind of what it feels like and this is not a woe is me this is just a something I realized this year is that going from only knowing people that know you ha being your audience online to having 99.99% of you um, your perception be, you know, whatever the algorithm is showing them of you is uh, just a complete energetic overhaul. And it's a shock that I can't describe that well right now because I'm going through it still, but I think that if you've been following me somehow since I was at like 200 subscribers to now, you can see the difference in the way that I've had to um, rise to the occasion or even the way that I've spoken about having a following is that it's energetically traumatizing for better or for worse if you grow online. 21. <laughs> This was big and this was recent, so this one is one that I am um, very focused on as we speak actually, and it's that if you only enjoy the pro- or I have to start over, this is too good for me to fuck up. If you don't enjoy the process of something and you're only working towards the outcome, you're in a cycle of toxic productivity. That if you do not enjoy the process and you are only working towards the outcome, that is funneled by toxic productivity, that you're focused on being this productive nothing for something that you think will make you feel better in the end. And I noticed this actually years ago when I grew up acting and I only wanted the applause and I didn't want to do any of the work that I saw other people really enjoyed. Um, not that I didn't like the creativity, but 
just things in the acting world that other people were really into and I was like why are they into that like that's weird where that's just like wasn't me and I was doing it for the outcome not the actual love of it and it's something like with video editing I outsource that because I don't love that and I can't pretend that I am the creative genius there um, other things with content that I think I have the tendency to be like oh that would get a lot of views and that would go viral but if I don't like the process of doing that like some transition videos on TikTok that are like fun and cutesy I don't enjoy those as much as me talking and teaching and even though the outcome is sometimes more engagement or um, knowing that I'm not going to show up as flagged in the algorithm um, it's still not the same in that way so if you're also someone who tends to work towards outcomes to make yourself feel better but hate the processes investigate uh, 22 and this one's big so you might have heard this one before but I wanted to end with it all suffering stems from attachment if you're into Buddhist teachings you've heard this there's no way around negating this and for better or for worse our attachments which are part of human life always lead to suffering and I'm learning that now and a lot of what I was attached to is huge huge inflation for what I felt like was going to take me to the next level in my life or whatnot has been ripped away and um, just in multiple levels with school with um, just the day-to-day the -day acts of school and liking that and with TikTok obviously which I will never stop making a big deal out of probably because I'm just so so triggered and so my small self is throwing a tantrum but that all suffering stems from attachment and the sooner that we can recognize that and avoid attachments that have brought us pain in the past the more that we can refine our interaction with the world to be of observation rather than white knuckling so those are 22 things that I am learning in my 22 years and if you have learned anything um, I would say like write however many years and those amount of things in the comments but I know most of you were in your mid 30s so that would be a lot of a lot of things I can see my analytics I have mostly viewers older than me but if you like to share anything have any thoughts do let me know down below um, I'm sending so much love and I will see you in the next one there is one thing you're all